Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello and welcome to episode 259 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. This episode, we're going to talk about helping you to create vibrant, exciting sexual life if you or your loved one experienced any sort of sexual trauma. The reason I decided to do these two-part interviews was because a few of my colleagues happened to publish two wonderful books on the topic of sex and trauma and I read both of them and I fell in love and I thought the books are so good that I cannot not share it with you guys so that's why I decided to have two episodes on this topic and our guests are approaching these topics from different perspectives so if the content of this episode resonates with you make sure you're subscribing because the next part we're going to focus on things and activities that you can do to promote growth, sexual growth and personal growth if you experience trauma. Our guests today are Jamila Dawson and August McLaughlin. I had August previously in the show and I got notification that she published this wonderful book with pleasure managing trauma triggers for more vibrant sex and relationships. And she generously sent me a copy and I fell in love. And that's how I met Jamila as well. In our episode today, we're going to talk about the impact of trauma on your brain. We're going to talk about common pleasure traps for survivors. And also we're going to talk about how BDSM can provide ability for some people to experience pleasure after trauma. And Jamila will tell us more about her experience of helping clients to feel empowerment through this modality. As I mentioned, one of our guests are Jamila Dawson. Jamila is the co-author of the innovative book, With Pleasure, Managing Trauma Triggers for More Vibrant Sex and Relationships. A licensed therapist with an expertise in sexuality, trauma, and relationships. Jamila has been sex educator since 2005 and has practiced psychotherapy since 2015. Our other guest is August McLaughlin. August is a nationally recognized journalist and host and the producer of the podcast Girl Boner Radio, a true story-driven podcast where she explores sexual empowerment, relationships, and pleasure. Her articles has been pop- featured on Cosmo, Washington Post, Sol- Salon, and more. You can read the full bio of Jamila and August in the show notes. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Jamila Dawson and August McLaughlin. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to have two wonderful people on my show, August and Jamila. August was on my uh, podcast before and Jamila, I'm, I'm meeting her for the first time. She's so wonderful. She's a fellow therapist and I read their book. The book was fantastic. It's about trauma. So uh, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. Thank you. It's yeah, wonderful. thanks for having us. I am very excited about your book and I hope many people get a chance to check it out. If if you are interested in, top, in this topic, this is such a great resource. We're going to talk about a part of it, but I feel like every page I was reading, I was highlighting. And I know some people have a reaction to someone highlighting a book, <laughs> but I'm totally a highlighter. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I tend to write in the margins and highlight. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I know the book, part of it talks about triggers. So tell us, how do you guys define triggers? Mm -hmm. So I would, just to make it kind of simple, that triggers occur when the body is overwhelmed, where it, it senses danger, whether, and not to worry about whether it's real or perceived, but it senses danger and it goes into um, four different possible responses, which are fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And only recently have we been hearing more about the fawn response. And I'm very grateful for that because it's it's a real response. And it's, I think, one of the ones that's least understood. But basically, like, the body is feeling overwhelmed. And so these are the four ways it tries to figure out how to get to the next moment, how to survive. 
Well, it was very wonderful to re- read about it and how you guys talk about sometimes in media, we, we see that people are using it incorrectly. So whenever we don't want to kind of like talk about things, we're uncomfortable about conversation, sometimes we use the term trigger, which, which is not necessarily what we're talking about here. Now that you guys define it more in the context of a trauma. And I think it's important for people to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we wanted to mention that at the beginning because it can be a really helpful term. It's also been kind of co-opted. Some people use it to make fun of people, which is horrible. And then some people use it to talk about anything that's a little annoying. And so if somebody is really dealing with trauma triggers, hearing folks use the term to talk about, you know, I bumped my elbow or I don't like the taste of this food as much as this other food or whatever it is, it can feel, you know, like it's kind of diminishing your experience. Absolutely. And, you know, in the book, you have stories of people, which is very powerful. And I think sometimes it's easier when we are especially around trauma, we're hearing other people's stories. It was interesting for me to read August's story. And I'm I'm curious, how did you guys interested in writing this book? How did you guys meet? So tell us more about that. Yeah, so the initial idea for the book came from a personal place for me, I was dealing with a lot of trigger flares and really struggling with managing trauma several years back. And the way that I approach things, I like to really try to understand what's happening. And as a writer, writing is how I understand things. I am much better at understanding through writing than I am just speaking or hearing about something. And in addition, I was hearing from a lot of folks, like readers and listeners of Girl Boner from my previous book and also listeners of my podcast, as I'm sure you also hear from so many folks about their own experiences. And people talk to me about pleasure, you know, Girl Boner is so much about pleasure. And almost every time someone would write to me about my Girl Boner book, they would mention some kind of trauma. And I have a section about trauma in that book, but that book is didn't dive deeply into it. And so I also felt this sort of sense of responsibility to provide something that can be helpful for folks. And then I had Jamila in the podcast studio before the world kind of shut down. And I, had, I hadn't um, moved forward with writing the full book, but I had a proposal in the starting phases. And I was listening to her speak about managing trauma and about pleasure. And both the way that she speaks and also uh, her perspective on these different topics felt so resonant to me. And I knew I wanted her involved in the book somehow. So I did eventually ask her first to write the foreword and then to co-write it. She'd only met me once. So yeah, I knew asking anyone to participate in a, <laughs> in a book is a, it's a big, you know, it's a big ask. Yeah. And so I can pass it on to Jamila to share a little bit about her own experience, but that's, that's where it came from for me. Yeah. And it was, I so enjoyed the the podcast experience with August, but I had kind of, it was like a one and done in my mind of like, okay, did this thing go in? Oh, I had a good time leave. And that's the end of it. When she asked me to do the forward, I thought the idea was great because it's what I care about is helping people with trauma and pleasure. Um, And then when she asked me to co-write it, that was, overwhelming and exciting and scary. And I'd also recently had an experience very unpleasant around race and a racist thing that happened to me from another sex educator who was a white woman. And so it's, I was triggered in the truest sense of the term of, I felt frightened and I felt like I wasn't sure how to navigate and wanting to just say no, you know, and just get away from it. And luckily with like therapy and support that I've done, I was able to recognize like, oh, this is, I am not making this from a true decision place. And so um, I had a very clear and transparent conversation with August and what we all hope happens when we talk about our trauma, that somebody meets us where we are and validates that maybe I don't completely understand the experience, but I understand that you need something and you need support. And so August really offered that and that made it possible to like, oh, maybe we could do this. And so we've just been taking it a step at a time. And it's been an amazing, amazing process, especially trying to write a book, which is intimate when we're just using computers and when in the middle of a pandemic. 
It's been incredible. Beautiful. And, you know, I, as I mentioned, I really enjoyed the book and I was laughing with myself when you were talking about what sex therapy is and what people think, like what happens in sex therapy, that <laughs> why, why you would want to do that. They all, I'll always ask me, oh, you have a PhD and you want to, <laughs> you're doing sex therapy. Oh. It's like something dirty, like, or right, like I'm right. perverted or but yes. That is Still. so interesting. But like many, many of my colleagues, they're, they are pleasure advocates. They want to help right. people to work through the challenges. Yes, talking about fun things are great, mm-hmm. but sometimes it's not at the heart of it. Sometimes we need to have some healing to be at the place that we're ready to be open and lean into the pleasure. Exactly, exactly. That there is this um, dynamic between that, as August said, that there's people who want pleasure and who are trying to find pleasure and they're having experiences or have had experiences of trauma. And you can't, I think, really fully talk about one and encourage people to be in the pleasure place without speaking about the other part. Well, tell us more about the brain aspect. I, I love it when you when people kind of bring some scientific information to conversation, because when it comes to ter- trauma, people at times feel, oh, God, it's all in my head and why I'm stuck. But I, I really appreciate that you guys went through the kind of giving people an overview of what happens. And it's, this is true. So tell us more about that piece. Oh, yeah, because I love that chapter. Like, uh, <laughs> no, August, yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm so into the brain totally fascinates me endlessly. And yeah, so essentially what happens, there's a couple parts of the brain that are involved when we are triggered, when we're really activated in, in trauma. Um, one is the amygdala and one is the prefrontal cortex. And we talk about it in the book as the kind of smoke alarm and security system. So the smoke alarm would be the amygdala. And it basically alerts us like there's danger. And then the prefrontal cortex is where we process our emotions, things kind of get settled and figured out and all of that. And so what can happen when you're triggered, when you've been going through trauma, when you're managing trauma, your amygdala can become, especially if you have PTSD, can become extremely reactive, like hyperactive to all these um, perceived risks and dangers. And sometimes, you know, there is something going on, um, but other times it can seem like something so benign on the surface. And your, your amygdala is like, oh my gosh, no, this is danger. This is, this is really bad. Um, and that is what sets off those fight, flight, freeze, uh, fawn responses. I will add a little thing that I read a study about recently since we wrote the book that I find super fascinating, which is that the amygdala also is affected by estrogen levels. Mm. And so uh, if you are a person who menstruates, you can experience uh, more significant symptoms of you know, reactions to trauma and stuff like that at certain parts in your cycle. And this particular study looked at people who menstruate, a large number of them had been dealing with PTSD. Mm. And so I, I just think that's so powerful to know, like for me as somebody who, who manages PTSD to know that, oh, PMS is going to be, that's why I feel so much more like activated around that time. Um, just that awareness can be helpful. Yeah. And I really think that the awareness alone and kind of understanding can improve those brain reactions over time. So we can also, also nourish and nurture these the pathways in our brains. Mm -hmm. And that's where healing comes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I I think it's important to understand that, that this is not all in your head. And there are systems in in your body that they're there because it's the function is your protection. Uh, But sometimes we haven't worked through the challenges. And as you, I I know, you mentioned the book that this fire uh, kind of like smoke detector thing is constantly activated. And sometimes something that's very interesting is is that, you know, we, we all talk about like how our body remembers and it comes from the kind of wonderful book. And sometimes we don't, we might not even have the memory of trauma. And it happens a lot with my clients that they say, okay, I consented, but in the middle of the act, the certain kind of touch mm-hmm. kind of like the tree really triggered me and I was really struggling and they feel yeah. guilty about that. So that's definitely important to know that that's part of what, what are, what's happened for people. And sometimes it's common. Right. Right, right. It's quite common. And that's, I think we're still as a culture working through kind of the mind body split as though it's just mind or brain and just body and they're disconnected. 
and I've been trying to practice lately saying mind body to like link them in my head of they are the same thing. And so when it's just in your head, there's no just, it is in your mind body, it's in your brain body. Um, this is actually happening as far as your nervous system is concerned, this is real. And so to take it seriously. Absolutely. And sometimes people are, I know I talked about my challenge in August podcast. I, I, for years, I struggled with dyspronia and painful sex, and it was really tough. And sometimes we're trying to do this mind over body thing, saying that, you know, yes. I can muscle through this, or, you know, if I can like, you know, ignore that I'm very triggered, then it's going to be okay. But yes. what happens that when we're doing this, like, first of all, we're not resolving the issue and the other pieces at times people develop all sorts of secondary issues like sexual health issues because of that right right and then I, I think August and I were really like we want to give people tools and exercises that help them slow down and be with their body and not override it and force it and become one more kind of warden that separates people from their their true experience Beautiful. So I know that you talked about the fawning response. So many people often heard about fight, flies, and freeze, but fawning is an interesting one that sometimes people don't know about it. And I know you wrote about it in the book. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So fawning is really appeasing somebody or tending to someone else's needs over your own. It might be showing affection for somebody who is threatening to you. And people get confused by that because they think, oh, that means you must, you know, enjoy this experience when someone's harming you. But it's actually the opposite. It's a survival mechanism because sometimes you do need to play along or you need to try to appease somebody so that you can be safe. Like all of these reactions are trying to keep you safe. I was going to say that it's, I think this is the response that when August and I were have written about this, that is the most troubling for people. And as August said, people blame themselves and they think I must, um, it's very confusing. And it really, it's, it's the response I think that is the most incredible in terms of if we can't fight the person off, if we can't run away and being still will not end the thing or make us like survive the thing, then this response is like, I think one of the most incredible ones that we have. And I, the two of us really wanted people to understand how incredibly useful and there will be time later to kind of unpack it and have compassion for what we might have said or done but it is an incredible way to get to the next moment. That's what our body is trying to do. Just get to the next moment. So beautiful and powerful. And I think at times that's, that's the response that people struggle with understanding it later on. And that yes. leads to the blame. Like I'm thinking about if I, uh, you know, I was like, did what I needed to do to get out of the situation, then uh, maybe I contributed to that. All of those horrible messaging that we hear. So it's it's normal to think about. It's helpful to think about, okay, that, that was what it was needed, as August and Jamila both mentioned. And now we're in this moment. And how can I protect myself? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that has helped me is to think in, you know, numerous scenarios with different kinds of, of triggers, when we are triggered, we feel typically quite vulnerable. And so it's harder for us sometimes to give ourselves that same grace that we would give a loved one. And so I will think what I tell my friend that, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. You know, this is all your fault. No, I would not. And so trying to, to treat yourself as that friend is important. Absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. Sometimes also have clients have a hard time thinking, being gentle with themselves as like a younger person or even just, you know, speaking kindly to themselves. And so the, if they can't do that piece, the, the kind of best friend talking, then I'll suggest most people will not be cruel to a small animal. Most people like that, that viscerally will be very gentle. Mm. So also like if there was a, like, what's your favorite animal? Kitten, a little bobcat, like a little puppy. If that puppy was scared, how would you talk to it? Would you use a bunch of big words? Would you use a bunch of, you know, jargon? Or would you let tone and slowness and small words communicate to that animal that it's safe? And sometimes for some reason, 
people can connect with that a little more easily. So that's that's my, my go-to of yeah. most of us will be kind to a small scared animal. I love that. I haven't heard that before. And I think that's amazing. And, you know, I, I work with some survivors. And what I notice with survivors is at times when you're doing your the inner child work, it's really, really con- hard for them to connect with that piece. Mm-hmm. Even when, like when we bring up the pictures of them when they were very young and they experienced abuse and all sorts of horrible things. And mm-hmm. they even have a, a kind of visceral reaction to that part of themselves because of how like they didn't tell anyone about it, how they responded during trauma. And, and that's really hard for them to kind of practice self-compassion. Yes, mm. it truly is. It truly is. And self-compassion, I don't think there's, I think that's where the healing really, like if the the journey of it begins with practicing over time, self-compassion, which August and I really did have to practice ourselves (laughs) as we were writing the book. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh yes we were applying every single thing we were writing about like <laughs> the whole book we're like oh pleasure practice don't forget the pleasure you know because one of our major points that we're presenting is that these pleasure practices are so important in our lives and so we really had to remind ourselves which tells you you know this is not a simple thing it's not a quick fix thing and we anything that tells you that there is a quick fix that's usually a bad sign if someone's trying to sell you a, a program this can fix your trauma in 6 weeks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. probably not i love that i think that's so great and i think like i'm laughing that you said like you you were practicing it yourself because that's that's also what i do i feel like these are the practices that you have to do every day uh, if you're really showing up for life and to the point that Jamila made about the kind of like the process of it and how long it takes. I remember when my therapist recommended kind of like doing like several, I don't know, now or a decade ago, like the the close your mind, eyes, like visualization of a a small child. I was like, I'm not doing that. This is so cheesy. (laughs) You're like, no, no. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And now like 10 years later, I have the picture of my childhood when I was struggling and the frame next to my office so definitely I came a long way but I I know at the beginning I was like no (laughs) this is not what we're doing right it's such a clear like no that's not gonna work no I'm not gonna do that no that's stupid and then that softening um that can happen so yeah we we definitely and it was so beautiful to write this together because you know we're we're on deadline and we both have other things we're trying to do And I think there were times we kind of rescued each other, you know? Mm -hmm. I know that I, times where I felt, you know, I wasn't doing enough or I wasn't getting it done the way that it should have been done. And August would come through of like, you've got a lot going on, like, and would just offer that compassion I couldn't offer myself. And so it was, again, this, yeah, mutual rescue and mutual care. Yeah, same. All along the way. It, It just, it's so wonderful to have someone that you want to support because that ends up supporting everything. And you, <laughs> you know, um, it just, and it, it's such a solitary process to write a book. And so, especially when you're holed up in a pandemic. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> and so we had our weekly meetings and we would talk through these, these topics and that's where it came from. Yeah. Beautiful. And I feel like just such a feminine way of working through things like because with men they would get angry and like and I'm sure there are plenty of men that are lovely and wonderful and have a beautiful gentle soul but I feel like you know validating that honey you have a lot and you're played <laughs> that's not what we learn in a group work <laughs> right it's collaborative right. let's mm-hmm. do this together yeah yeah and we're definitely hoping that because we do have I think at least like three or so maybe four stories from cis men and I'm really, I, I'm so thankful that they're in there because I want cis men to read the story. I want other folks to read that there is, there is emotion there. There is sensitivity there. And like, this is how we build new possibilities for one another. And so men don't have to default to the like, just barrel through and get it done. And I got to make it happen. And ugh. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we brought up such a great point. I felt these stories were very diverse. And we were talking about it right before we started the recording that how it portrays a range of people's experiences. And I think that's really powerful and unique. 
because sometimes I feel even in a kind of a classic psychological book around trauma, you hear the story of a cisgender woman that had some trauma and not invalidating that, but like then like she was able to find cure and like she, she went, uh, she was happily ever after. And sometimes right. that's not the case. Right. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Oftentimes that's not the case, that the world is huge and there are so many people. And if we think just about the United States, that there are so many people of color, so many different orientations, so many different genders. And we were really, excuse me, we were very, very clear that we wanted a book that a variety of people could tap into, that talking about trauma and pleasure is not just the domain of upper middle class, white, cisgendered people, that it belongs to all of us. Well, one part of the book that was also, and all of it was fantastic, one part that was very unique that you guys talk about pleasure traps. So tell us about a few of the pleasure traps that you could talk about in the book. Sure. Yeah. So we talk about basically these barriers that we can have between ourselves and pleasure that can make it much more difficult to cultivate these practices. And we can do it without even realizing it. It's so easy to fall into. So we tried to bring awareness to some common ones and invite folks to share their own as well. There's a number that we cover. One could be procrastinating, where you could do something really pleasurable. And then all of a sudden, it seems like a great time to vacuum your house and do the dishes and do all of these X, Y, and Z other things. Another one could be you have a sexual partner who is not really into a certain thing and you really want to try it, but you know that they aren't into it. So you just kind of try to stifle that in yourself. And that can be a really difficult one because first of all, I mean, even having the conversation that can be a trap too, feeling like you can't talk about your pleasures and your desires, but it really is so painful to, to experience and also to Hero folks denying themselves of something that could be wonderful that may bring a partner a lot of pleasure because you value it. Right. You know, I think that's really important. Right. And this again, even taking time, I don't think we, you know, when we're eating or when we're taking a shower, just the daily things that we do of life, I think often we're just trying to get through to the next thing and move to the next thing and get it all like done. And any of those moments are opportunities to slow it down and really, you know, enjoying like how suds feel on your hands or the scent of the body wash that you're using, noticing if you don't like that particular body wash and maybe getting another one that is more inviting. But just again, kind of, I think so often we're kind of zooming over our lives, you know, and like, and on a map, right? Just like, oh, there's my life down there. And it's like, no, like land, go be in it. This is your life. This is your life. Yeah. I really felt that another one that I see a lot and hear about from folks is considering yourself to something to mm -hmm. be worthy of pleasure, mm -hmm. body image concerns. I'm mm -hmm. too wrinkly. I'm too flat chested. My penis is too small. You know, these things that we tell ourselves that come from perhaps like societal norms, quote unquote, all of those things can really stand in the way as well, comparing ourselves to other people, mm -hmm. you know, and so instead, we don't do the thing that could actually help us feel better about those parts of us. Right. Absolutely. And I, I like that you're kind of like, you both were talking about even everyday pleasure, because sometimes I feel that people, they, they feel like they need to justify if they want to kind of lean into pleasure to talk about guilty pleasure, or they right. have to give like, this long explanation, I work really hard this week, I did all of this. And now uh, I'm allowing yes. pleasure to myself. You deserve to have pleasure, even if you haven't done anything this week. <laughs> right, right. Because you're alive, because you're human. You deserve it. But you're absolutely right that like the indulgence or the guilty pleasure thinking, you know, when you when you really listen to how people think about pleasure, it is usually laden with guilt, with you have to do something to deserve it, that it's going to corrupt you in some way if you do it too much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I hear so much about that from folks who grew up in conservative religious cultures or purity culture, evangelical churches. There's this idea that you're much more holy if you deny yourself. And so you have to earn pleasure by denying yourself pleasure. And you're a better person if you deny yourself pleasure. 
And to me, that is just absolutely tragic. It fuels yeah. depression, anxiety, stress, trauma, relationship problems, a whole laundry list of things. Yeah. So understanding sometimes we might not think that something that is prohibitive in our, let's say our sex lives has anything to do with what we learned in Sunday school, but it's really important to look at those things. Like, where did I get this message about my body? Where did I get this message about masturbation? Yeah, it's important. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you that like the messaging that we get from our childhood, it's so embedded in us that it gets activated in random times that we might not even, like it may, might not even your parents' values, right? That like it might have different values, but then you pick it up from the kind of schooling that you had. And absolutely. that can be also create challenge absolutely that I think in some ways you know every child does move through you know you listen to your parents and you're influenced by them but then you reach that point where the larger world is influencing you and I think that sometimes can be even the most poisonous time of learning that your body is not what it should be or learning you know you're starting to watch more different kinds of media and you see the same kinds of bodies or the same kinds of stories or the same kinds of people in stories. Um, my parents were very, very clear that they would have Black media in our home, books written by Black people and African people, um, that the art that was in our home reflected us and our history. The dolls that I had, they weren't good about like the binary, the boys, like they wouldn't get me quote unquote boys toys. So I still really want to get a remote controlled car. I really oh. do. You know, yes, that, like, I want you to have one. That's a <laughs> like, great a Voltron, idea. A Voltron and like a remote control car. I got to have my reparative experience. But they were, and I am so profoundly, as the years go by, so profoundly grateful that they mindfully created, like they taught me that you can create your reality and how important it is to do that. So a lot of my work with clients is what media are you consuming? What media can you be consuming? Um, who are you listening to? What are you watching? What music are you listening to? Do you have a lot of like labels with images and do those images feel good for you or not? Like we're going to, from the ground up and the top down, we're going to reconstruct your world. Beautiful. I, what a thoughtful parent you had. I feel like I, I got no sex education. <laughs> <laughs> Because I grew up in Iran and my parents' values were very different than the kind of like a overall societal values. So I have mm -hmm. so many like mix of information. My mom had this very tasteful French erotic corn <laughs> that uh -huh. I discovered uh -huh. earlier. Uh -huh. And in the school, it was like very kind of like focused on abstinence and like, you know, that like if, if you, you know, one of the classes they were saying that if you shake hand with a guy, he's going to have emotions toward you. And I raised my hands like, you know, we shake hands all the time. Nothing happens. <laughs> What's happening with my hand? <laughs> You know how kids are what? like, what's on my hand? <laughs> my throat head. I was thinking about something else. Right. Oh. Is there something wrong with uh. me that I don't? I mean... Mm. And you can just see how these things compound. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Well, one of the, uh, I, I, I can talk about this all, all uh, for hours. Oh, oh, <laughs> but right? like... One of the things that I loved about your book, another part that I really enjoy was about the BDSM and how that can be mm. a, a corrective experience for people. And I, I love that story. So is that something that you guys see that like people uh, find peace in different uh, sexual, alternative sexual behaviors? Tell us more about that. Mm. I feel like this is your magic place, one of your many magic places, Jamila. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly a topic that I, I feel incredibly passionate about um, and could talk for hours on. So I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much, but it's, it's, I'll take a step back and say that BDSM, what I am seeing from some people is that they're using BDSM practices instead of therapy for their trauma. And I do not recommend that. I do not recommend using BDSM or Tantra or any other alternative practice in place of trauma therapy, if somebody has trauma. Um, those practices can be therapeutic, but they're not therapy. And so I think it's really, and we talk about that in the book, the difference between that. But what I do see is because at its best, BDSM and kink, there it's about seeking consent. It's about collaboration. It's about negotiating with the person. And by negotiating, really saying, oh, I'm into these things. And the other person saying, I'm into these things. What of these two menus can we do together? And just that process of listening to what feels good in your body and then what feels good for the other person, 
again, we're now integrating the mind and the body together. And so, and in any given BDSM scene, which is, can be a few minutes to a couple of hours, it's the play that people do together. There is, again, this constant checking in and seeing self-assessment of seeing how the person is experiencing it, the other person's paying attention. And so it can be this incredible, vivid experience of how I feel and what I think about how I feel, and I'm not alone in it. And that can be profoundly reparative for people. Mm. Oh, yes, that was so beautifully said. We have a story in the book featuring a man named Wolf, and he talks a lot about his experience that I think demonstrates some of those things. And he shared that one thing he's found in BDSM communities is that he's able to communicate in some ways about trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, without having to say the actual words yeah. and that that has been a really helpful tool for him and that he has grown because of the consent conversations and the boundaries conversations that mm -hmm. are so much more prevalent. I think, I think there's this stereotype that somehow BDSM is just this like wild world with no rules and nobody respects anyone, you know, if you, mm -hmm. if you aren't familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so, I mean, of course, there's always going to be like a bad quote unquote, bad apple. Like there are mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. good people in every realm of the world, but by and large, what I have found is that the folks in these communities are much more proactive about consent much more thorough about boundaries, mm -hmm. safe words, all of that. Mm -hmm. And those are tools that go so far beyond sex. Like right. this is life stuff. It's huge. Right. That's why I talk about kind of the BDSM DNA, a lot of letters there, but, <laughs> but this idea of, and sometimes even BDSM folks don't do this. We're like, we have this emotional technology that can be used in so many different aspects of our life of what to have for dinner or when there's a conflict about money, you know, which we all know is a big one of having a conversation of this I want to do this with the money because this means this to me about money the same way that we can say like in kink of I really want to be spanked because like that I love the rhythmic nature of it and it's very relaxing to me to be able to share the story of it or um, a good top in BDSM will say what do you want to get out of this scene what are you looking for in this particular playtime together Mm -hmm. And you can ask that for, you know, if you're having kind of a conflict with one's partner, what are you hoping to get out of this conversation? What are you hoping where we can go? And so you really, it's, it's, I find it just a profound um, tool. And also there's the subspace and top space. So when you're playing for a while, both people have a neurophysiological experience that they have of um, the bottom will usually have this kind of floaty, euphoric kind of Zen experience. And then the top will have um, what's called flow state, where they're hyper-focused, time falls away, and they could just be in this realm forever. That's amazing. I mean, people get that when they're running or when they're doing other stuff. And I'm like, oh, you can do it with like sex and bodies. Might as well. So. I don't know if you remember this, Jamila, but you pointed out that I had done a scene with I really enjoy erotic photography, like just for myself, it's fun to participate. And I remember describing to you, Jamila, about my experience and how, like, I think I said I was high, like I was high from it. I couldn't quite drive afterwards. I was like, uh, I need to like turn it into this ritual. And, and I remember you saying, oh, you had like a scene, like you had a scene partner. And I was like, I, oh my goodness, you're right. Like I had this whole arc, this whole story, all of these, it, it was so eye-opening for me to, to see that. And it's true. You know, it doesn't have to look a certain way just because I'm not into, say, flogging. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that I can't be a kinky person and, and have my kinky right. scenes and, and all of those wonderful benefits. Right, right. That experience, we can find ways to create that. You don't, you know, black leather is awesome and I love corsets, but it's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sign me up for the flow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Light up for the flow experience. That's what we want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We all, I feel like, uh, like many of us, like believe for those kind of special moments. I feel like that's what like makes life so juicy. Mm -hmm. Having those experiences that keep make us so feel so alive. Yes, yes. I can talk about you guys with you guys forever, and especially you both have such beautiful voices. <laughs> oh, that's so kind. So do you. Yes, I know. Oh. I'm like blushy. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to make 
make sure that we're talking about all of the wonderful resources you guys are providing to your audience. And if our uh, listeners want to connect with you, get the book, where are some of the places they can go? Yeah, they can find me um, through my website, which is jamiladawson.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram as jamila.thesextherapist. And I'm on Twitter as Jamila Dawson. And I'm on Twitter a lot. <laughs> I love Twitter Beautiful. too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my podcast is called Girl Boner Radio. It's a narrative podcast uh, with all kinds of true stories about sexual empowerment. And I especially recommend your episode and uh, Nazanin and also Jamila had a wonderful appearance not too long ago where we also shared voices of numerous survivors mm. uh, in the book who talked about their own pleasure practices. So if you're looking for more, you could just search for Girl Boner Radio wherever you listen and uh, scroll down and you'll find those. Otherwise, you can go to girlboner.org to find all the things I'm doing. And with pleasure, managing trauma triggers for more vibrant sex and relationships is our book. And you can find it pretty much anywhere books are sold. It's on Amazon, IndieBound. You can get it from your favorite independent bookstore. It's also an audiobook. We had a wonderful narrator for that. So if you'd prefer to listen, it's an ebook and also paperback. Beautiful. And I, I, I got the copy of the book and it was just so, so well written and relevant to kind of like what people are experiencing. So I, I read it in one seating almost. Oh, <laughs> it was so wow. good. So wow. thank you so much for sending the book. Thank you so much for both of the work that you, you both are doing, just helping so many people. And I definitely invite my listeners to get a copy for themselves, whether they are therapists. I know we have lots of therapists in that list, our listeners. And also if you're a survivor, I think it's a great resource for everyone. Thank you so much for having us. This is yeah. Thank you. This is great. I love everything you do. Thanks for the work you do as well. Yes. Thank you, ladies. I hope you found our conversation meaningful. One thing that I've been noticing more as I'm reading Jamila and August's book and our guest next episode guest book is about how common these violation in the society that you know, many researchers, they talk about big T traumas like rape or sexual assault, like major sexual assault or little T traumas, the violation that every day many women and men experience with cat cat calling or someone grabbing you in subway and growing up in a conservative community. I, I, I was reflecting on my own experiences and how I, as a young woman, I had to be on the lookout, like almost have these guards up to make sure is not anyone not doing anything with my body because of how common these violations are. And the story that's present for many people is that what what did you do that promoted that, which of course is horrible. So if you are a young woman or man that you experienced all of these things that we talked about, or if you feel drawn to the content we talked about, but perhaps you don't have the big T trauma of the rape or the kind of sexual assault, maybe then this book can be useful for you as well because of how common and prevalent are these violations. At the end, I wanted to also remind you guys that since we just passed 2 million downloads, I'm doing a special episode on answering your question. So if you have a sex related question, you can record your voice on our sexology podcast website and we're not going to announce your name. We'll play the audio clip and I'll personally answer your question in next couple of weeks. So don't forget to record your audio and I cannot wait to hear your voice and make sure you're checking out our next episode on trauma as well. I'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.